last lecture we were talking about uh, uh, the exoskeleton of the insects and the molting process. And, and we went through, uh, what, what's the first stage in the molting process? Do you remember? I find this interesting. The, the uh, professor that, that teaches our general entomology course, our entomology 4,000, or yeah, 4,000, uh, uh, she had given a, an exam almost at the same time. And, and she gave a, a uh, uh, question on that. She, she had like five or six steps of the molting process, and, and the students were supposed to arrange them in order uh, for that. Uh, what you know is the first step. Actually, the first step in, in the molting is that the insect fills the current exoskeleton. And what that does is it causes stretch receptors in the exoskeleton to send some messages to the nervous system, which cause the release of some molting hormones. And, and so the first step is to fill up the old exoskeleton and, and stimulate those nerves. Now, we didn't talk about that, but I, I just wanted you to know that there are actually some steps that I kind of left out. Uh, then that hormone uh, that, that's released that says, hey, it's time to molt, uh, is released into the body, it affects the epidermal cells, and the epidermal cells basically start to divide. Uh, and so they divide first. Then what we find is that the old exoskeleton and those epidermal cells separate. There, you can see that the epidermal cells withdraw all of their little processes that they have up in, into that cuticle, and there's a little gap that forms in there. Uh, then some new uh, ep uh, epicuticle is produced. You need something in there to protect those cells and the new uh, uh, exoskeleton that's going to be made in there. Then there's what we call a molting fluid that's released into the gap. Uh, that molting fluid is then activated, and that molting fluid has what kind of ace in it? Can you imagine? What would be, pardon? chitinase indeed so basically what this has is a digestive enzyme in there that digests the unhardened or unsclerotized uh, chitin that's in that exoskeleton and so it basically digests uh, uh, and usually the the pictures and the photos of, of these things are inadequate uh, for that uh, because that, that endocuticle is is the thickest part and, and by a long way so a lot of that endocuticle is digested until it gets up to the the exocuticle uh, that, that's in there uh, and then uh, uh, basically new cuticle is laid down and, and finally, the last thing that has to be done is that you've got to shed or molt. Uh, the, the term for that is ecdysis, uh, the old skin. Then you have to continue to build up the, the new exoskeleton and harden the new exoskeleton and, and so forth. The one thing that we didn't talk about uh, in the last lecture uh, was, again, a review uh, of the different life cycles of the insects. Uh, with that molting process, remember that we have to sort of couch that around the life cycles of these. And remember that insects usually have two types of life cycles. They either have the incomplete life cycle, in which the nymphs look like the adults. The only real difference is that the nymphs are usually smaller. They don't have functional reproductive organs. Uh, and in most cases, uh, they may have wing pads. In other words, they've got tissues. Uh, on the uh, 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 meso and metathoracic region that will eventually turn in uh, to the actual wings or form the actual wings, but it's really only the adults that have the wings. Uh, and again, we've seen quite a variety of these. Uh, and, and this one, I've, I've decided to use some line drawings to, to see, uh, show you those. Uh, over there on the left, uh, we can see a tree cricket. And again, you can see the, the first, second, third, fourth, fifth, uh, instar uh, nymph in that case. Uh, being a female, it's kind of interesting, you can actually differentiate the female here in the third instar. You can see the, the rudimentary, uh, rudimentary beginnings of the ovipositor uh, beginning to form on the sternites um, and the uh, abdomen in that. And again, they get larger and larger. You can also see that it's not really until you get into the fourth instar that you can actually see the definite wing pads. 
and the fifth inch star of those wing pads are, are quite well defined, uh, but then when the adultus form, those, uh, those tissues unfurl uh, and, and get blown up into the fully uh, developed wings. I don't know if you remember, but back in the thrips, uh, we, we talked about that they have an unusual or highly modified incomplete life cycle. Um, and unfortunately, uh, the thrips specialists say, we want to use our own terms. And so do you see some of the problems with the terms that they've got there? They say uh, first instar larva, second instar larva, pre-pupa, pupa, and adult. Though this is an insect, if you think about it, that nymph, which they're calling a larva, looks pretty much like the adult. It's got the same shape, body shape, mouth parts, all the rest of it, it's just an immature. But because some of the unusual things that go on in the thrips biology, uh, they've decided to, to divide this up. And basically, what they're indicating is that the first and second instar nymph, what I would call, what they call a larva, is an actively feeding stage. And so they're actively feeding and growing. When that second instar nymph molts, it molts into what we call a prepupa that no longer feeds, but basically all it's doing is developing the external wing pads. Uh, usually in most of the thrips, the prepupa can still walk around and, move, and uh, is quite active, but when it's ready to pupate, it often drops off of the plant, digs down in the soil, or finds a really secluded place to really hunker down and not move. And, and basically what it's doing is it's transforming all of its uh, exoskeleton material uh, into the wings which will uh, be uh, defined in, in the adult. So again, it's because of the behavior of these that we have a feeding and non-feeding nymph stages that the thrip specialists often call them larvae and pupae and pre-pupae. Probably the, the most important group in the here was the hemiptera, the true bugs and bug-like insects. And I've got some examples. Uh, uh, we have the, the box elder bug there, and you can again see eggs, a couple of nymphal instars. Uh, most of the bugs actually have five nymphal instars in, in the true bugs. Uh, and in that box elder bug, they're only showing you a, a few of the nymphs. Uh, here we have a uh, potato leaf hopper. Uh, and again, you can see the five nymphal instars, and, and really, uh, you can see there that in the third nymphal instar that you can begin to see the formation of the external wing pads, uh, and they're really pretty well defined in, in the uh, fifth nymphal instar, and then of course when the adult merges, they're fully developed wings. Uh, same thing happens with the chinch bug. Uh, we can see uh, uh, usually no evidence of the wing pads in the first and second instar, but then we begin to see just a little tiny lobe occurring in, in the third instar. That lobes, or those lobes for the wings get larger and larger until the, the uh, fifth instar nymph where we begin to see some pretty substantial uh, wing pads. When it goes to the complete life cycle, remember now we're going to have those four separate stages with virtually all of the growth and the instars, as we call them, that would be in the larval stage. The transformation stage is the pupa. Uh, that's the one in which we have to transform not only the external anatomy of the larva, but also its internal anatomy into what will be the adult form. Obviously, in this one, uh, we're talking about uh, the things like the Neuroptera, uh, where we can see the, the Neuroptera have these uh, sort of uh, lizard-like or alligator-like uh, larvae uh, that have these piercing-sucking mandibles, yet the adult uh, of something like the lacewing looks nothing like that at all. It has uh, the regular chewing type of, of mouth parts, very large, broad wings with lots of, of veins and cross veins in it. Uh, in the beetles, uh, remember that the beetles are an extremely large and diverse group. Uh, we can see that, that virtually every suborder of the beetles often has even a different larval form. And, and so the larvae can vary considerably in there, but they will eventually all, when they pupate, uh, form these external wing pads, which will then eventually turn into the elytra, the first pair of wings, the wing covers, uh, and then the membranous hind wings. When we get to the Lepidoptera and, and Diptera, uh, we can see that the, uh, in the Lepidoptera we have those uh, what we call erusiform larvae or caterpillar-like larvae. 
And how did we define those larvae? They have prolegs. They've got these stumpy, fleshy, leg-like structures on the abdomen. And when it comes to the lepidopter or the caterpillars, uh, again, they would have five pairs of those or fewer that would separate them from the sawflies and, and the hymenoptera. Uh, again, uh, virtually all the caterpillars are leaf feeders or plant feeders, whether they burrow into the plant and feed on the plant material or eat the leaves of the plant. Though, with that said, it's kind of interesting. Uh, there are actually a couple of parasitic lepidoptera. Uh, that, that uh, can, can uh, feed on other insects and, and actually the larvae may even burrow in and, and parasitize the insect. Also we find that there's a few Lepidoptera that the larvae instead of trying to figure out how to digest cellulose uh, can digest uh, things like keratin and we'll talk about those here in a couple of weeks. Uh, the closed moths are a group of uh, caterpillars that actually can eat your woolen uh, sweaters and, and carpets and things like that, and they're capable of, of digesting that keratin. When it comes to the diptera, uh, the so-called primitive diptera uh, usually have elongated larvae that uh, have reduced uh, legs or, or no legs at all, but they always, always have a head capsule. But what we call the higher flies have a true maggot. And, and these larvae are extremely highly modified. You see no he evidence of a head, no legs. And as a matter of fact, the spiracles have been reduced. Uh, these maggots basically only have a pair of anterior spiracles and a pair of posterior spiracles with a long tracheal trunk that runs between those. Now, you might wonder, that uh, that's, that seems pretty bizarre, but let's think about this. If you're a maggot uh, burrowing into uh, a dead, decaying, rotting body, uh, you don't want spiracles all up and down your body. You basically want spiracles at the front, so if you stick your head out of the dead body, you can breathe. Or, most importantly, what we see with most of the maggots is they stick their tail end out. Uh, and, and they can get air into the major tracheal trunk that way uh, and, and not worry about uh, getting bacteria and other contaminations in their uh, uh, spiracles if they were all up and down the thorax. Now, here's some actual pictures of some of the critters. Uh, here, here's a uh, bill bug, uh, one of the insects that I work with in, in turf grass. And again, you can see the, that it has an egg, larval instars. Uh, now, bill bugs, I, I actually uh, just got an email uh, about two weeks ago from uh, Great Britain. Uh, they were finding these weevil larvae on a golf course, and, and uh, the lady that sent me the picture said, Dr. Shuttler, can you identify these? And I said, uh, actually, when it comes to weevil larvae, the only way that we can identify them right now is through genetic fingerprinting. I'd, I'd have to run a PCR analysis of that and figure out what it, uh, what, uh, which ones they are, because as you can see, they have virtually no external defining characteristics uh, on them. And, and so uh, a good number of these weevil larvae, they all look the same. And, and so we have to do, and the beauty of genetic fingerprinting is that we can identify them. Now once they reach the, the pupil or the adult stage, we can pretty well identify at least what subfamily they may belong to and, and as the adult, even what species. Uh, below that uh, is, is a sod webworm. Uh, this, uh, this is the uh, barred sod webworm. Again, egg. In this case, we can see uh, uh, six larval instars. Uh, since there are six larval instars, I know that that's a female. In, in many of the Lepidoptera, the males have five larval instars and the females have six larval instars. And we've talked about that in the past. If you're going to produce eggs, you need to have a bigger, more robust body. And so by going through an, an extra instar allows you to build up the fat bodies and the body mass that would be needed in order to produce the eggs as an adult. <coughs> the last thing that I wanted to talk about here is actually part of the most difficult uh, and, but I did want you to understand that when we talk about the molting process, there are basically two hormones that most entomologists talk about. There are, there's more going on than that, but we're just going to talk about it as, as basically being controlled by two hormones. The two hormones that I want to talk about is, is here, uh, what, which is called uh, ectosteroid. Uh, in many books, they would call it ectdisone. 
uh, and that's the molting hormone that I indicated to you that once there are stretch receptors in the body, send the message to the, the nervous system, and it's, it's uh, basically uh, housed up in, in the uh, uh, prothoracic uh, area, those uh, nerve tissues in the prothoracic area release the ecdysone, which initi initiates the molting response. Now, most of you haven't thought about this, but how do I determine when molting is initiated whether I'm going to remain a nymph or a larva, in other words, a juvenile form? And the answer to that is that also in the insect body is a hormone that we call juvenile hormone. We try to make it complicated. <laughs> okay. So here's what happens. If the message goes out to molt, the ecdysone, the molting hormone is released. If there is juvenile hormone in the body, then the next form that the insect will take will be a juvenile, whether it be a nymph or whether it be a larva. On the other hand, if juvenile hormone stops or ceases to be produced, the next molt will be the next stage, whether it be a pupa or an adult. Got that? So we take a look at this. Here we have a caterpillar. And what we see here is, is that uh, when, here we've got the fourth instar larva at the very end of that fourth instar when the stretch receptors are saying this caterpillar is filled up, all of a sudden we get this ecdysone or ectosteroid as it's, it's named here that causes the initiation of the molting process. So we, yeah, it goes through that uh, apolysis, you know, the, the separation of the exoskeleton, uh, 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 dissolving of the old exoskeleton, laying down the new exoskeleton, and so forth. Now, if juvenile hormone is present, you can see that, that the juvenile hormone is present in the body uh, at the time that that, uh, that ecdysone is, is going on here, uh, and, and so we would get the molting, juvenile hormone is there. But notice that when this larva is completely mature, now we're in a fifth instar here, and the molting hormone is released again, when the molting hormone is released to initiate that, that juvenile hormone is missing right in here. So the next form, for the, the, in the case of this caterpillar, is going to be a pupa. Now, if this were a true bug, what would be the next stage? If that were a fifth instar chinch bug nymph, what would be the next stage? An adult, okay? And, and so, it, again, uh, in the absence of that juvenile hormone, we go into the next stage, not the next instar, but the next stage. Yes? So, uh, yeah, the, the, basically there's two hormones involved. There's what we, we you, we'll just call it molting hormone. When the molting hormone is released, that initiates that whole cascade of, you know, uh, separating the old exoskeleton, dissolving the old exoskeleton, laying down a new exoskeleton. But the form of that new exoskeleton is determined by the juvenile hormone. Okay. So when the juvenile hormone is present, if it's an insect that has an incomplete life cycle, it will be another nymphal instar. If it's an insect that has a complete life cycle, it will be another larval instar. Okay. But if the juvenile hormone is missing, then the insect will molt to the next stage. So if it's a true bug, a nymph, it will go to the adult stage. If it's an insect that has a complete life cycle, it will go into the pupil stage and then the pupil stage will molt into the adult stage. Got it? Yeah. Okay. I know we, we have graduate students that have trouble with this one, okay? Uh, and, and I understand, uh, 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 but I wanted you to, to, to understand this. Now, why should you understand this? We're going to talk when we get into pesticides that we can make synthetic molting hormone, we can make synthetic juvenile hormone, 
and we can make some chemistry, we can make some materials that interfere with both of those. So let's think about this. What would happen if I'm a caterpillar that uh, I've eaten a chemical that says uh, you can't make molting hormone? What's going to happen to it? Pardon? No, it's, it's filled up its exoskeleton. It needs to molt. <laughs> It'll literally blow up. Okay, if it can't make that new exoskeleton, it'll literally blow up. On the other hand, what if I had a little tiny first instar caterpillar that when it ate some food, it said, oh, stop what you're doing and molt. Since it hasn't filled up its exoskeleton, when it molts, it actually will molt into a smaller larvae than it was. And if that larvae eats again and says, nope, stop what you're doing and molt, it'll literally waste away to nothing. So we can play some cute little tricks on these. Now, when I was back at Penn State, uh, there was a new uh, molting hormone mimic that had come out, uh, and, and uh, we were able to, to make some giant gypsy moth caterpillars. Now, normally, the gypsy moth caterpillar is about three inches long, but we were able to make, uh, since we, we also had juvenile hormone with us, uh, we were able to make some gypsy moth caterpillars that were literally six inches long. Now, obviously, to me, that's not the right way to go. We don't want giant caterpillars eating our forest, okay? But it was kind of interesting that, that we could do that uh, in, in the laboratory. Likewise, uh, in the juvenile hormone, uh, we were able to make, uh, we used a material that basically blocked the juvenile hormone. So we were able to make gypsy moth adults that were about a half the size of a normal adult because we said, nope, you gotta molt, uh, juvenile hormone's not here, so they started molting into the adult form way earlier than, than they should have. Uh, now, why am I mentioning this to you? We are finding out that many of the insecticides that we use today, that we prefer to use, actually mess up this hormonal system of the insect. And the reason why we like to look uh, use them is, what do you think the toxicity of those insecticides are going to be to you? Since you don't have an exoskeleton, you don't molt on a regular basis, virtually nothing. And, and so uh, that, that's why uh, many entomologists and, and pest management people are moving towards this kind of chemistry because they really only affect the target insects. Unfortunately, what other arthropods molt? All arthropods molt. And so some of these hormones, we have to be very careful that they don't get into waterways uh, and other places because we could harm the crustaceans that are in the water or the other arthropods because they can have very similar systems and very similar chemistry.